A very good morning to all of you. I welcome you all to Insert Kari. So in this video, we'll be doing the analysis of the newspapers for 6th of March 2023. So let's start. So eight parties, they write to the Prime Minister against the use of agencies for political watch hunt. So their letter says that we hope you would agree that India is still a democratic country and the blatant misuse of the central agencies against the members of the opposition appears to suggest that we have transitioned from being a democracy to an autocracy. Then the misuse of the central agencies and the constitutional offices like that of the governor to settle scores outside of the electoral battlefield is strongly mm -hmm. condemnable and the manner in which these agencies have been used since 2014 raised questions about their autonomy and impartiality. So they believe that agencies like Enforcement Directorate and then Central Bureau of Investigation, CBI, they are being misused by the political party for settling their scores with their opposition. So tardy police verification nips Kashmiri aspirations. Valley residents, they feel that police are delaying the process of clearance to punish the people who may have relatives with separatist leanings and hundreds of applicants denied passports for the security reasons. So when we have a look at the passport count, so this uh, basically map is showing a look at the number of passports issued as a percentage of the total population in various states or UTs. So in Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory, it stands at 7.4%. And apart from that, in Maharashtra, uh, it is at 8.35%. Then in Kerala, it is uh, one of the highest, that is 31.6%. So in Jammu and Kashmir, an estimated 7.4% of the population are the passport holders. So we saw that in 2019, uh, the government of India, it scrapped Article 370 and post that. It created two union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. So Jammu and Kashmir has a, it has a legislative body, whereas Ladakh does not. And apart from that, they believe the people uh, of the valley believe that delayed or no police verification or the adverse police reports have left hundreds without jobs and passports. And according to the top uh, official resources, these have reached a five-digit mark in Kashmir, which is highest in the past decade. So Adani project is like a government-to-government -government deal, says the Sri Lankan finance minister. So Colombo sees that the Adani group projects in Sri Lanka as a government-to-government -government kind of deal. And... It was the Indian government that had identified the group for infrastructure projects, including the Northern Sri Lanka Wind Power Project. So stressing that his government was very, very confident that Adani ports, their airports and energy companies, they have strong fundamentals despite $140 billion drop in their share values. Since we saw that Hindenburg released its report, so basically, we are seeing that when it comes to foreign investments by the Adani group, it has not been impacted majorly. And then this is Malampuza Dam's catchment area as the water level falls in its reservoir, which is there in Palakkad. And it is one of the hottest districts in Kerala where summer temperatures cross 40 degrees Celsius. So dam supplies water in Palakkad town and six panchayats. So basically, we are seeing water availability of water dipping, specifically in the state of Kerala. So here, uh, you need to be like having ideas about how water needs to be conserved and managed. And when it comes to water pollution, how that can be reduced. So all of that becomes very important. Regulators' proposal on Rajasthan power lines flouts the Supreme Court orders and it threatens the great Indian bustard. So the population of the critically endangered species, it has dipped to less than 150. So the great Indian bustard is critically endangered. 
and in a move that helps the solar power projects in Rajasthan, but it may hinder efforts to make the region safe for the endangered Great Indian Bustard, the Central Electricity Authority it has proposed that only power lines below 33 kilowatt, they need to go underground and the rest be fitted with the board tie voters. So this is the thing from the Central Electricity Authority. So you need to be clear about its like composition of this body and its origin apart from that we like we have discussed the thing a lot that the electricity or the power lines they are one of the major threats to the population of GIB that is great indian busted and the decision has been taken that only the power lines which are below 33 kilo kilowatt they would be like uh, they would be basically shifted to underground so that the birds, they do not hit or the power lines and that is obviously one of the major threats to their life. So conservationists, they have objected to the move as they say that it could lead to the extinction of the bird also because we are seeing that the number is still declining and it is very less. And the proposal was part of the draft regulations issued and it is open to public comments. So it came against the background of an ongoing case involving the threat to the bustard and other birds from the power lines. So high tension power lines in Rajasthan and Gujarat from the solar plants often lie on the flight path of these birds and this is the threat to their lives. So the matter is of particular concern to the future of the bustard as fewer than 150 of them remain and existing conservation methods, they fall short of replenishing their numbers. So in 2019, the environmentalists, they approached the Supreme Court, which in 2021, it directed that all, all the low voltage power lines in areas demarcated as a priority and the potential habitats of the Great Indian Bustard in Thar and the Kutch deserts, they need to be pushed underground all all the low voltage also and solar when we talk about solar projects so a majority of the power lines from rajasthan solar projects they have a rating above 33 kilo kilowatt and several such proposed ones they are expected to pass through the priority areas also so the court order would have required several existing and the proposed lines to move underground hiking the cost of the supplying solar power so obviously this is a, a it's an expensive exercise and it would be increasing the cost of solar power transferring it. So already we have a lot of challenges when it comes to making solar power viable, economically viable in India because still the, the cost is very high because we are dependent upon the photovoltaic imports when it comes to the solar power projects. So when we talk about the landfill, so Kochi chokes as fire at the waste dump, still it rages and government has the people to stay indoors because obviously the air becomes highly toxic and not just the air, even it leads to water pollution as well. So hospitals, they've been asked to prepare for emergency admission of patients with respiratory distress and to stock up on the medical oxygen also. So high level meeting attended by the union government officials discusses the long-term solutions to this problem, including the bio mining and using microorganisms to break down the waste. So these are some of the long-term solutions to the problem of increasing numbers of landfills. So this is not just in Kochi, it is also a problem in New Delhi as well. So these are some of the solutions when we're talking about the in the long term perspective
So play Hollywood responsibly. Do not create a chaos. Don't play colors with unwilling persons. Don't throw water balloons at strangers. Don't use chemical or the metallic colors. So here you can find out more about what all chemicals and how the metallic colors, they are toxic and how they can be harmful. Don't harass women. Don't triple ride without helmet on two wheelers. Don't overcrowd your vehicles. Don't drink and drive and don't pick a fight with others. So these are certain things which you need to keep in mind while playing holy and celebrating holy. So utilizing India's moment under the diplomatic sun. So New Delhi is on a geopolitical high and it hosted the G20 foreign ministers meeting recently. The G20 finance minister is meeting and the Quad foreign minister is meeting and the national capital has been teaming with the global leaders and thinkers attending the Ministry of External Affairs of Holy Raisin our dialogue as well. So a few weeks ago, India also organized the Voice of the Global South Summit as well. So definitely India is on a geopolitical high and for a country that has for too long inhabited the silence of the world politics, criticizing and completing too powerless to assert itself and often seen as an irritant by great powers for even having an opinion. India's pivotal position as a G20, the Quad, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Global South. Today, it has given it a sudden surge in stature and reputation. And yet one year is too short in geopolitics and geopolitics is not always a function of happy coincidences so for new delhi it is this is its moment under the sun and the near realization of a long awaited pivotal power moment for it so from the pre independence days uh, through the 75 years of its independent existence indian leaders from jawaharlal nehru to A.B. Vajpayee to narendra modi they have often spoken of india's role in the world that it's culture, its history, demography, and economic strength provide the country with a strong foundation for such a role. So for most part of its history, though New Delhi was too weak to assert itself or too unimportant, but the solid foundations laid through the decades, they are now starting to make a difference. And contemporary Indians' pivotal position in the world politics is thanks to a fortunate confluence of the deliberate and unforeseen factors which appear to be working in New Delhi's favor. So far stronger economic and military power courted by the great powers, New Delhi has cleverly used the failure of the post-war world order today to its own advantage. And the worry about an aggressively rising China has further prompted the global leaders to look for geopolitical alternatives in the Indo-Pacific region. And India is definitely emerging one of the most important ones. So treading the fault lines, contemporary Indian foreign policy is a textbook example of treading the fault lines of the world politics and our external affairs minister is Shashankar. He writes in his book, The India Way, that advancing national interest by identifying and exploiting the opportunities created by the global contradictions. So to, to use the pedestrian language, we can say New Delhi has become adept at playing both the sides, though not without its cost. And consider this, say, uh, India is the chair of both United States, West-led G20, and the China centered uh, even the Shanghai Cooperation Organization at the same time. So that is on the case, and it is seeking to be at the global high table while staking a serious claim to be the leader of the global south as well. So... We're playing different roles and on the Ukraine war also, New Delhi has not alienated directly or indirectly any of the parties involved in the war in a big way. And while the looming threat of China, it has brought it closer to the US and the West than ever before in its history. So New Delhi is also an active member of multilateral forums, which has China in it, which includes BRICS and SEO. And we also talked about RIC, which is which includes Russia, India, China. So contemporary India speaks the language of revisionism and status quoism in the same breath and with ease. So that's how you can see like we are also having a strong relation uh, with the West. We are also participating in organizations and forums where China is also a member. However, we are seeing that we're, right now we're not having that too healthy and good and comfortable relations with China on, on the border. Apart from that, we are also emerging as a leader of the global south. 
So this is definitely showing that something is happening. And so what does India want? So New Delhi's objective is not difficult to understand. It has long wanted a seat at the global high table that is at UNSC, but it has realized that it has little chance of getting one currently and particularly with the United Nations Security Council. It is out of reach and it has therefore been hinting at the dysfunctionality of the UNSC. So this is one thing why we need reforms of UN and the utility of the more inclusive and flexible forums such as G20. So Mr. Modi's argument at the G20 foreign minister's meeting that global governance has failed is to drive home precisely that point only. And after taking a dig at the current global governance structures, he also went on to say that we are meeting at a time of deep global divisions. We have a responsibility to those not in this room. So underscoring the importance of G20 and India's role in it. Even though the meeting it ended without a joint statement, thanks to the Ukraine war, and it was a success for at least two reasons. So one was that it created the environment for the U.S. Secretary of the State, Antony Blinken, and the Russian Foreign Ministers, Sergei Lavrov, to have a meeting for the first time since the war began a year ago. And second uh, success was when most other forums, they are unable to bring together the wearing parties in one room, G20 has been able to do it. So these, we can say these were one of the two important things that emerged out of it apart from that talking about the challenges so new delhi's moment in the sun is not without its inherent challenges for one the sun will set and the moment shall pass so we should utilize it in the best possible manner and india's chairpersonship of the g20 and the seo ends this year and beijing will not let new delhi take over the leadership of the global south so easily so it is not so easy as we say that india is emerging as leader of global south so we have china also as a major challenge to tackle that and so is a new delhi using this crucial year to strengthen the strategic partnerships seek ge the geopolitical concessions uh, concessions and create structures that enhance india's national security so in geopolitics national glory is not necessarily an enduring outcome so the second important challenge pertains to the optics and framing so is new delhi making friends during this diplomatic high or is it offending more than befriending so some of the language that emanates from New Delhi in response to the Western or the USA statements or criticisms could be construed as needlessly offensive and while riding high on diplomatic success being subtle in one's assertion has far more utility notwithstanding the domestic political uses of the harsh foreign policy assertions so Indian diplomacy needs to adopt the language of Chinese and authority rather than that of aggression and confident nations need not talk like reactionaries so confident people or confident nations do not react thirdly balancing the opposites has its limits limits so here we're talking in the context of the russia ukraine war as india is trying to balance and we have been able to successfully balance between our interest between russia and the west so if you play all the sides you might not end up making strong strategic partnerships that should come to your aid if and when something major goes wrong such as future conflict with china so this is definitely true. But while bridging the divide in the world politics is a noble task, indecisiveness might not yield lasting partnerships. So we need to be confident and clear when it comes to our stand over the Russia-Ukraine war. And finally, there is always a danger of governments using the diplomatic highs such as this towards the domestic political ends rather than for the geopolitical objectives. So will the New Delhi utilize the 2023 to prepare for 2024's general elections or to strengthen the country's place in the committee of nations? Or like, are we really going to use it for strengthening our position? and strategically uh, strengthening our relations at the global level or not. So that would be seen. So the non-governmental sector should not be dragged into the legal quagmire. So this is in the context of the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. And scrapping of the license of some of the NGOs, so the decision the government of India to suspend the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act license or the country's premier think tank, that is the Center for Policy Research, is bad in optics and substance. 
So the reasons that are being cited by the authorities includes the lapses in the income tax paperwork of CPR's staff, then there is lack of due process in the accounting processes and diversion of funds to publication of books, which the authorities allege is not part of the CPR's objectives. So these are some of the allegations and on the basis of which their license is being scrapped and an eagerness to drag the prestigious institution into a quagmire. the legal processes is writ large over this entire exercise. So basically, CPR, it has been working on improving the governance and enhancing the state capacity, among other things, in collaboration with governments and public and private sectors. So there are many advocacy and campaign groups that have been facing the wrath of the government in the recent past, but the action against the CPR lowers the bar of tolerance for the political establishment to an abysmal level. So the FCRA is a regulatory mechanism to ensure that the foreign vested interests, they are not unduly influencing the domestic politics of India, but sweeping application of the law in a, in a manner that clearly disables the NGOs it suggests a thoughtless approach bordering on vindictiveness. So India's new education policy, it envisages academic exchanges and cooperation between Indian and the global institutions to raise the standard of higher education and research in the country. So India also wants to emerge as a center of technological excellence and manufacturing. So recently, two Australian universities, they announced that they have the plans to have campuses in India. However, India's global ambitions, they are clashing with the insecure and reactionary state actions such as the restrictions on CPR. So collaboration with the world requires the flow of information, personnel and funds in both the directions and restrictions on all these for the national security reasons are part of the rule everywhere and they are acceptable. But these are to be exercised sparingly and you can't use them so often. So that is thing and the government should not merely tolerate but facilitate the emergence of several more institutions such as the CPR. So breakdown of the higher pension scheme with judgment provided for the new provision under the employees pension scheme of 1995, who are the prospective beneficiaries? Then will there be additional liabilities for the employers? What are the documents that need to be uploaded in order to avail of the higher pension? So basically, why is the EPFO doing this? So let's understand it through it. With the introduction first. So the long wait of subscribers of the Employees Provident Fund organization and those who retired after 1st September 2014 to apply for the higher pension fund scheme under the Employees Pension Scheme of 1995 came to an end on 27 February with the organization providing a web link on its members page. So the prospective beneficiaries fall under two categories, those who retired after 1st September 2014 and those who were in service prior to the date and they continue to be in service. So the critical element is that in either of the cases, employers, they must have made provident fund contributions in excess of the mandatory ceiling of the pensionable salary. So why is EPFO doing this? So the present exercise of EPFO has been necessitated by the judgment of the Supreme Court given on 4th November 2022 in the EPFO versus Sunil Kumar B case. So the verdict, apart from upholding the 2014 amendment brought in by the union government, had given an opportunity to all the employees on as on 1st September 2014 who did not exercise the option under the paragraph 11 of this EPS rules for higher pension, but they were entitled to do so, but they could not, uh, could not due to the interpretation on the cut off date by the authority. So it clearly stated that the time to exercise the option shall stand extended by a further period of four months. So in the light of the court's directions, EPFO issued a circular laying down the broad contours of the eligibility.
So the amendment, the 2014 amendments, they basically raised the pensionable salary cap to rupees 15,000 a month from rupees 6,500 a month and allowed employers to contribute 8% of the employee's actual pay if it exceeds the gap uh, towards the EPS. So between November 16 and uh, 1995 and May 2001, the salary cap was 5,000. So right now it is at 15,000. So how will the pension be calculated? So the pensionable salary, which represents the average of the last 60 months of the salary, will have to be multiplied by the number of contributory years in the summer, which is to be divided by 70, which indicates the average longevity for an Indian. So the calculation process is not so important for us. So will there be any financial impact of this decision or not is or what we need to look at. So in the event of the authorities clearing the applications for higher pension, the pensioners and the subscriber will have to remit to them the amount that represents the difference between the portion of the PF contributions transferred earlier to the pension fund and what would have to be paid based on the actual salary. So in the case of the subscribers, a certain portion of the amount lying with their individual PF accounts, they may even get transferred to the pension fund after their applications for higher pension gets approved. So as all the pensioners would have received their terminal benefits, they will be required to make their payments separately. And in any case, the payment will include the interest to the rate of which will be indicated by the authorities later. So going by what is available on the portal, the entire payment will have to be made as a single tranche, and employers will be required to bear the administrative charges, which are expected to be nominal. So we're not expecting any major financial impact. So we will be requiring some documents for that. And should one opt for a higher pension or not is a question. So answer to this question varies from person to person, obviously, because everybody has different perspectives. So higher pension may provide a sense of economic security after the retirement. So this is one thing. But the amount that a pensioner gets during his or her lifetime will get halved on his or her death and paid to the spouse. However, the amount that is lying with an employee's provident fund account will be paid totally to the employee's spouse in the event of his or her death during the service. So what are biocomputers and how do they function? So what is this new area of research outlined by scientists as the, at the John Hopkins University? So scientists at this university, they recently outlined a plan for a potentially revolutionary new area of research called the organoid intelligence, which aims to create biocomputers. So here the brain culture is grown in the lab. They are coupled to the real world sensors and input output devices. So the scientists, they expect the technology to harness the processing power of the brain and understand the biological basis of human cognition, learning, and various neurological disorders. So what is the premise of this technology? So understanding how the human brain works has been a difficult challenge. And traditionally, researchers, they have used the rat brains to investigate the various human neurological disorders. So how, now in a quest to develop systems that are more relevant to humans, Scientists, they are building the 3D cultures of brain tissue in the lab, which is called the brain organoids. So these mini brains, they are built using the human stem cells and capture many structural and functional features of a developing human brain. However, human brain also requires various sensory inputs to develop into the complex organ it is and the brain organoids developed in the lab aren't sophisticated enough so they also do not have the blood circulation which limits how they can grow so basically they are not really the actual human brain we can say in some sense so then how do we study the brain so recently scientists they transplanted these human brain organoid cultures into the rat brains where they formed connections with the rat brain, which in turn provided circulating blood to them. So since the organoids, they had been transplanted to the visual system when the scientists showed the experimental rat's light flash, the human neurons they were activated too, indicating that the human brain organoids were also functionally active. So that's how basically they have tried to overcome this challenge. And what is this new biocomputer? 
So the JHU researchers scheme will combine the brain organoids with the modern computing methods to create a biocomputer. And they have announced plans to couple the organoids with the machine learning by growing the organoids inside flexible structures affixed with the multiple electrodes. And these structures will be able to record the firing patterns of the neurons and also deliver electrical stimuli to mimic the sensory stimuli. So the response pattern of the neurons and their effect on the human behavior of biology will then be analyzed by machine learning techniques. So that's how basically they would be used and would be used for understanding different diseases also, the function of the brain. So are biocomputers ready for commercial use or not is a question. So currently the brain organoids, they have a diameter of less than one mm and they have fewer than one lakh cells so which make it roughly 3 million the size of an actual human brain. So they're not really actually the same in size when it comes to the actual human brain. So scaling of the brain organoid is key to improving its computing capacity. And the challenge is now to establish the long-term memory. We hope to achieve this within one or two years. So up applying this to the patient cell-derived brain organoids like autism and Alzheimer's donors is already on the way. So we might see benefits for drug development in this decade as well with the help of this technology. So away from the spotlight, India holds the Conference of Global Intelligence Chiefs. So counterterrorism, radicalization, drugs trafficking discussed at the Resina Security Dialogue on 1st of March, which saw participation of officials from 26 countries, including UK, France, and Japan. So that is there. And USA was absent, so it was a broad-based discussion and shows the global confidence in India. Apart from that, while U.S. was absent, the intelligence chiefs from the U.K., France, Japan, and Bahrain, they were among those present. So India quietly held the second conference of intelligence and security chiefs and the top officials from around the world, which is called the Resin of Security Dialogue. And India is trying to make its presence felt and bringing together the global intelligence agencies for exchanges on the issues of common concern. So the focus of discussions was largely on the global security, which encompassed counterterrorism, radicalization, drugs trafficking, and illegal arms smuggling, among, among other things. So conducted by the security conference, it is organized by the country's external intelligence agency, that is we have raw, that is research and analysis wing, and the National Security Council Secretariat that reports to Mr. Doval. So the conference, it was held for the first time in April 2022, a day before the start of the race in our dialogue. So India's flagship conference is on geopolitics and geostrategy when we are talking about the race in our dialogue. So that is focusing upon geopolitics and geostrategy, which is organized by the Ministry of External Affairs in collaboration with the Observer Research Foundation. So deep differences over Ukraine between US-led Western countries and the Russia-China combined throttled India's attempts to bring out a joint statement at the G20 foreign ministers meeting also. So some challenges because of the Russia-Ukraine war that we are seeing, but at the same time, definitely we can say uh, right now in the editorial also, we saw that how India is playing different roles at the global level and it is trying to assert itself, trying to show how important it is uh, how important is India to the world? So nations, they secure pact to protect the marine life in high seas. So comprehensive protection of the endangered species and habitats is now finally possible on more than 40% of the Earth's surface. So for the first time, United Nations members, they have agreed, agreed on a unified treaty to protect the biodiversity in the high seas. And the treaty agreement concluded two weeks of talks in New York. So an updated framework to protect the marine life in the regions outside the national boundary waters, which are known as the high seas. 
So the regions outside the national boundary waters are known as high seas. They had been in discussions for more than 20 years, but previous efforts to reach an agreement had repeatedly stalled. So we have now a unified agreement. So this treaty will create a new body to manage the conservation of ocean life and establish the marine protected areas in the high seas. So the UN Biodiversity Conference's pledge to protect 30% of the planet's waters as well as its land for conservation is another thing. When it's come to when it comes to the biodiversity conservation. So this is where for the very first time that we are getting a binding agreement for the high seas, which until now have hardly been protected. So comprehensive protection of the endangered species and habitats is now finally possible on more than 40% of the Earth's surface. And, and the treaty, it also establishes ground rules for conducting the environmental impact assessments for the commercial activities in the oceans. So it means that all the activities planned for both the high seas, they need to be looked at. So not all will go through a full assessment, but at least they would be now monitored and assessed before being approved. So this treaty will help to knit together the different regional treaties to be able to address threats and concerns across species ranges. So ex-RBI chief says that India is close to Hindu rate of growth. So all of us definitely know about what is uh, like what is Hindu rate of growth. So sounding a note of caution, the former uh, former RBI governor Raghuram Rajan so said that India was dangerously close to the Hindu rate of growth in view of the subdued private sector investment, high interest rates, and slowing global growth. So obviously these things are challenges for us at the economic front and definitely they take certain time lag in having the actual consequences at the ground level. And this is what is coming from the ex-RBI governor. So it is very important thing. We cannot ignore this. So he said that sequential slowdown in the quarterly growth that we are seeing as revealed by the latest estimates of the national income that was released by the National Statistical Office. We saw that the third quarter we uh, increased by 4.4 percent so the hindu rate of growth in terms of describing low indian economic growth rates from 1950s to 1980s which averaged around four percent so this is what do we actually mean by the hindu rate of growth so it was between 1950s to 1980s that is post independence to signify a slow economic uh, growth rate that averaged around 4%. Between this period is referred to as Hindu rate of growth. And of course, the optimist, they will point to the upward revisions of past GDP numbers. But he said that I'm worried about the sequential slowdown. So with the private sector, it is unwilling to invest. RBI, it is still hiking the rates and the global growth is likely to slow later in the year. I'm not sure where we find additional growth momentum. And the key question is what Indian growth will be in the fiscal year 2023-24. So RBA projects an even lower 4.2% for the last quarter of this fiscal. So at this point, the average annual growth of October-December quarter relative to the similar pre-pandemic quarter three years ago is 3.7%. So this is dangerously closer to our old Hindu rate of growth. We must do better. So government, the government, he said, was doing its bit on infrastructural investment, um, but its manufacturing thrust was yet to pay dividends. So we've already looked into this issue of migrant workers in the state of Tamil Nadu. So they are being assured that they are secure and there's no need to feel insecure. 
while they work at different factories and in different streams in the state. So Indian Space Research Organization will be undertaking a challenging experiment of a controlled re-entry for the decommissioned Megatropics 1 satellite. So Megatropics 1, it is a joint Indo-French satellite which was launched in 2011 for tropical weather and climate studies, which was providing data services supporting the regional and global climate models till 2021. So Space Agency, it said that it was as a responsible space agency committed to safe and sustainable operations in the outer space, it was gearing up for this challenging experiment of undertaking a controlled re-entry of this satellite. So we have the problem of space debris for so for uh, as a responsible space power. China increases its defense spending by 7.2%. So definitely it has different interpretations for different countries and specifically India being a neighbor of China. It is a cause of concern for us. So as a spokesperson for the National People's Congress says that the rise in spending is needed for meeting the complex security challenges, Beijing announces a lower than expected GDP target of around 5% for 2023, outgoing uh, Premier Li Kiang, he delivers his last report to the NPC. So the armed forces should intensify the military training and preparedness across the board, develop new military strategic guidance, devote greater energy to training under combat conditions, and make well-coordinated efforts to strengthen the military work in all directions and domains. So this is what comes from Mr. Lee. So army carried out operations in a firm and flexible way and they effectively conducted major missions relating to border defense, maritime rights protection, counter-terrorism and stability maintenance, disaster rescue and relief, COVID-19 response, peacekeeping and the merchant ship escorting. So Sri Lankan fishermen, they fiercely opposed the proposal to issue license to the Indian fishermen. So they are the Sri Lankan fishermen, they are opposing this proposal. So coming to Mint, we are seeing and discussing about the long road to sustainable development. So last week, G20's meetings in Bangalore, it's our discussions on how multilateral institutions, they can be strengthened to address the global challenges while retaining focus on sustainable development goals and poverty eradication. So what are sustainable development goals? These are the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development. It aims to end the global poverty and hunger and fight inequalities. So it also seeks to build peaceful, just and inclusive societies, protect the human rights, promote gender equality, empower women and girls, and ensure the lasting protection of the planet. So there are in total 17 SDGs in all, so which come into which came into force on 1st January 2016. So each of the SDGs, they have their individual targets and indicators. So for instance, we have the targets to combat the climate change, include strengthening the resilience and the adaptive capacity to climate-related hazards amongst others. So what are some of the challenges to SDGs? 
So the UN SDG report of 2022 stated that COVID-19 adversely impacted all the SDGs and wiped out more than four years of progress on the poverty eradication, which pushed around 93 million more people into extreme poverty in 2020. Then another challenge is the Russia-Ukraine war, which has caused food, fuel, and fertilizer prices to skyrocket. So apart from that, from the third challenge is coming from climate change. So increased heat waves, droughts, and apocalyptic wildfires and floods, they are already affecting billions of people around the world and causing potentially irreversible damage to the Earth's ecosystem. So these are three main challenges in uh, achieving SDGs. So how has India performed in meeting the goals? So India's overall SDG score, it improved from 16 to uh, 2019 to 66. And this was due to exemplary countrywide performance in goal number six, that is the clean water and sanitation and goal seven, that is about the affordable and clean energy. So we are performing well when we are talking about transition towards green energy. So Niti Aayog has the mandate to oversee the adoption and monitoring of the SDGs at the national level. And the states and Indian territories, they are key movers on the SDG action, action agenda of the country. So what are some of the steps India has taken? So according to UN, more than 41 crore people, they exited poverty between 2005-06 and 2019-21 in India. And area of special protection schemes like focus on aspirational districts, which resulted in improvement in health, education, fiscal inclusion, and basic infrastructure. Then we have the progressive framework of the national education policy. We have Aadhaar and Jam Trinity. So Jam stands for Jandhan, Aadhaar, and Mobile Trinity. So One Nation, One Ration Card. We have Mission Life, that is Lifestyles for Environment. These are some of the important measures that have been taken by the government. So what more can be done to achieve these SDGs? So while digitalization of the resource distribution has reformed the delivery mechanism substantially, focus should now be to transform the delivery mechanism into a beneficiary-friendly one. And this may require drastic administration reform, including the involvement of the private sector at the distribution level. So it is equally important to educate the people about its entitlements from the state, from the state especially various welfare measures. Coming to Financial Express, so uh, startups wanting to list to be ahead. So Sebi Moots promoter tag for founders holding 10% of the stakes. So this move will be a blow to professionally managed companies. So basically, uh, first we need to be clear with the term, what do we actually mean by a promoter of a company? So the concept of promoter, it is used in regulations issued by SEBI, other regulatory authorities. So ICDR regulations, they define promoter as a person named as a such an offer document or the annual return of issuer. So it could be a person who has control over the issuer directly or indirectly or someone on whose advice or directions or instructions board of directors is accustomed to act. So obligations include compliance with listing regulations, minimum lock-in disclosing material facts, and the private transactions. So regarding data sharing, the big tech, it can face penalties even under the consumer law. So users, they can invoke the act till data bill is passed. So in terms of privacy matters over data sharing, so Consumer Protection Act empowers the government to penalize firms for misleading ads, unfair trade practices, and users, they can flag data sharing among the firms without consent as unfair practice or unscrupulous exploitation. And data protection bill, when it would be enacted, it will have specific norms for the minimum data to be collected, purpose of use, and the storage duration as well. The fiscal deficit target of 6.4% for the current fiscal is within reach. 
and savings on the centrally funded schemes, extra tax receipts to help in meeting the fiscal deficit target. So we are in a comfortable position as of now. So rupees 4.5 trillion is the revised allocation for the centrally sponsored schemes. Rupees 3.1 trillion is released to the state so far out of this total. And of which rupees 2.15 trillion is floating with the single nodal agencies for schemes and state treasuries now. And rupees 1.4 trillion is the release of balances of the CSS budget depends on the utilization of the floating funds by states. So officials, they expect substantial savings in the centrally sponsored schemes will help keep the fiscal deficit within the revised estimates of 6.4% of the GDP. So India's per capita income doubles since 2014-15. And... It doubled to rupees 172,000 since 2014 when NDA came to power. But we are seeing uneven income distribution remains a challenge. So even if the per capita income is increasing, that is not the entire picture. We are seeing the income inequality, the wealth inequality is increasing at the same time. So as per the National Statistical Office, the annual per capita income at the current prices is Estimated at rupees one lakh seventy two thousand in in two thousand twenty two twenty three, which is which has increased from rupees eighty six thousand six forty seven in twenty fourteen fifteen, suggesting an increase of about ninety nine percent. So basically, uh, a development economy says that if you you are looking at GDP in the current prices, but if you if you account for inflation, the increase is much less. So here these figures are we can say in terms of the nominal terms and not in real terms. So when we account for inflation in these numbers, we would be having a much less amount of increase. So just to pose a very healthy and a good picture the num these it is possible that these numbers might have been used so these are the current prices if we'll be taking the constant prices into account we'll be having a much less increase so india's russian oil imports hit a record high in february so for a market share of less than 1% in India's import basket from the start of the Ukraine conflict in 2022, Russia's share it has now increased to 35% when it comes to crude oil supply to India. And oil imports from Saudi, it fell 16% month on month and that from the US, it declined 38%. So Russia continued to be the largest, single largest supplier of crude oil, which is converted into petrol and diesel at refineries for a fifth straight month by supplying more than one third of all oil India imported. So refiners, they continue to snap up the plentiful uh, Russian cargoes, which are available at the discounted prices to other grades. So India's imports of crude oil from Russia soared to a record 1.6 million barrels per day in Feb and they are now higher than the combined imports from the traditional suppliers of Iraq and Saudi Arabia. So India is the world's third largest crude importer after China and United States. It has been snapping Russian oil that was available at a discount after some. In the West, they shunned it as a means of punishing Russia for uh, its war in Ukraine. But uh, this we can say this has been one of the advantages that India has leveraged out of this war. And we, when we have a look at the number of the special washroom accounts, so that number touches to 50. So we have already have had a discussion uh, in detail regarding how they are set up and how do they function, why this is important. So basically, in short, when I tell you the washroom accounts, they are used for trade between two countries, specifically here we're talking uh, with uh, India and Russia as we understand them with the help of an example. So to carry out trade using the Indian rupee, we need to set up the washroom accounts to carry out the transactions in Indian rupee and reduce the dependence upon US dollar.
So NATOization of Europe, we are making the alliance that is NATO stronger and more capable. When I talked to Putin, I told him that oh, he was more likely to get not the financialization of Europe, which he was pushing for. So more like he got the NATOization of Europe. So the goal of doubling the farmer's income, it cannot be seen in isolation from the need to promote sustainable and diversified agriculture. So at the same time, both these things, they need to be met. So more than the subsidies that are given currently, we need innovations of technology, products, institutions, and policies for more high value agriculture that is also planet friendly at the same time. So when we talk about the Indian agricultural sector, the main problem here is that we have low productivity level. So when we focus upon productivity using sustainable methods, that would be one of the major boosters and increasing the efficiency, reducing the logistical cost can be another thing and improving the marketing, uh, making the process much more easier and comfortable without corruption would be a, another step that would be helping in increasing and doubling the farmer's income. So it can be also increased by the productivity can be also increased by better seeds, better irrigation. So it will have to combine with unhindered access to the best markets for the produce. Also making uh, the credit availability to the farmers is another challenge that we are facing. So diversifying to high value crops and even putting solar panels on the farmer's fields as a third crop could help raise incomes substantially. So it is only with such concerted and sustained efforts that one can hope to double the farmer's incomes, else the dream will remain unfulfilled. Coming to Indian Express, So talking about the Andamans incident, so government is putting in place protocols to tackle the threat of the spy balloons. So we saw that this topic was in news because of the China and USA. But uh, when we talk about the Andaman, so we are coming up with new protocols to tackle the threat from such spy balloons. So radars at key installations being upgraded in the tri-service plant. And from detection using the drones and aircraft to targeting and analysis of the remnants, the Indian military has drafted a set of basic protocols to tackle the newer threats like the surveillance balloons or other unidentified objects in the sky after a similar entity was spotted a year ago over the strategic Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So too many deer at Delhi Park, some of them may be moved to the leopard territory. So Delhi's forest department wants to move the deer from the deer park in Hoskas to the Asola Bhatti Wildlife Sanctuary, which is currently home to at least eight leopards. And the chief wildlife warden wrote to the Central Zoo Authority seeking approval for this move. So this would also be a step to promote ecotourism and curb the possibility of inbreeding depression at the deer park. So in the book Swaha's Diamond Rich Forest, fight to save 2.15 lakh trees has many shades. So book Swaha, it is located in the state of Madhya Pradesh. You can have a look, look at the location. Then it is near to Khajuraho. It is a very famous place. And here we have the capital of the state that is Bhopal. So the drive from the temple town of Khajuraho to the protected forest of the book Swaha is around... 120 kilometer and is in the early morning for almost half drive. There is not a single vehicle inside. So the villagers of Bokswai in Madhya Pradesh 
Chhatrapur district they live mostly of the forest and survive on the traditional agricultural practices so there is not even a single large industrial plant either in the district which is listed as under development in the official records so but deep under its dry deciduous forest so we have dry deciduous forest below the teak the salai and the care trees which are found the rocks laden with the asia's most precious diamond reserves which are located so a whooping 34.2 million Carrots, according to the prospecting mining estimates, which are embedded in 53.7 million tons of kimberlite, mostly untouched. So it is also a ground zero of a conflict that lays bar, uh, it lays bare the gap between India's push to leverage its rich bank of the natural resources and its global climate commitments. So as per an investigation by the Indian Express, it shows that around 2.15 lakh trees they need to be felled for an open cast diamond mine to operate in this region. So an active reforestation drive will be conducted by counterers, basically Rahul Siladia, who is the subdivision magistrate of Bijavar, who is uh, the jurisdictional authority. So the proposal is for trees in the Bhagsvaha to be felled stage by stage over a 15-year period and cutting of trees for the diamond mine and planting of new trees both can go hand in hand. And yesterday only as we were talking about if uh, the compensatory afforestation, so the main challenge here, it is the quality of land. So it is very easy to say that we'll be going ahead with the uh, exercise of planting more trees but it is one of the we can say very difficult to ensure that the trees the saplings they survive because again we are talking about the quality of land being the major challenge in this case so linking of pan and aadhar it is mandatory so get it done latest by 31st march 2023 and the late fee would be of rupees 1000 so you can get it done so the naval commanders conference begins today aboard the INS Vikrant so the first edition of the Naval Commanders Conference 2023 to be held at the seaboard indigenous air, uh, aircraft carrier INS Vikrant We'll be having the Navy Chief Admiral H. Hari Kumar along with the other top naval commanders who will review the major operational, material, logistics, human resource development, training, and other administrative activities undertaken by the Navy in the past six months. So Navy, it also test fires... Uh, the ship launched a version of the BrahMos missile. So Navy successfully test fired the ship launched version of the BrahMos supersonic missiles with an indigenous seeker and booster in the Arabian Sea. And the Indian Navy it carried out a successful precision strike in the Arabian Sea by ship launched BrahMos missile with a DRDO designed indigenous seeker and booster, reinforcing our commitment towards Atma Nirbharta in the defense sector. So amid the global push for millets, we are seeing that government's millet procurement to fall short of target by 40%. So the millet challenge government has been rallying behind the millets dubbed as Sri Anna to boost the consumption and to make India a global hub for the millet crops. So in the budget speech, a finance minister said that millets have been an integral part of our food for centuries and the fall in expected procurement target this marketing season could prove to be a challenge. So here the figures have been given for different states. So this is for the procurement in the previous years. So green is showing the production amount and the figures in red is showing the procured amount, how much of the production was procured. So basically when we talk about the states which 
depend upon millet cultivation basically most of them are south indian states karnataka it has one of the highest production of millets and apart from that we also grow it in rajasthan and maharashtra madhya pradesh uttar pradesh tamil nadu so here you can have a look and try to understand So Green Revolution 2.0 that mitigates impact of the extreme temperature and rainfall variations on crops is called for. So Indian economy, especially agriculture, is a gamble on the monsoon. And basically it means that if we are having a good monsoon, so we can expect a good harvest. Otherwise, it is exactly the opposite. So it all uh, completely depends upon the monsoon, the quality and the type of the quantity of the monsoon that we have. So the famous early 20th century statement by then Viceroy George Curzon perhaps needs a rephrasing today. So more than the monsoon, it is temperatures that are emerging is a greater source of uncertainty for the farmers. Access to irrigation can, to some extent, it can compensate for a failed monsoon or two. But the fact that the country produces more food grains now during the Rabi season than in the Kharif. That is, Rabi season is the winter to spring season and Kharif is post-monsoon season. That is testimony to the role of irrigation in the drought proofing. So, but... What can farmers do with the mercury spikes in Feb and March is the main concern. And we've been also talking about that increase in temperatures would be having and would be impacting the wheat cultivation. And these threaten the Rabi harvest, which were hitherto considered assured and immune from the rainfall vagaries. But even in the when we like talking about we are depending and we are performing well in the Rabi season. So again, for the Rabi season, the main challenge is going to be increase in temperature. So while Rabi crops were always vulnerable to spring thunderstorms and the hails, the risk from the from them it pales in comparison to that on account of the shorter winters and advanced onset of summers. So this is a new emerging challenge for us in the agricultural sector. So the impact of temperature surge was seen in March 2022 also when the wheat crop had just entered its final grain formation and filling stage and the heat stress led to early grain ripening and it reduced the yields. And we're already suffering from the cereal inflation. So climate isn't the only risk farmers are confronting. Even at the prospects of wheat, they are uncertain. We are seeing that the prices of onion and potato, they have crashed. So mustard too is trading below its minimum support price with the arrival of the new crop. So a far cry from, from the situation a year ago when the edible oil inflation had peaked following the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But now we are seeing that the mustard prices are too below their MSP prices. So the dual risk from climate change and the prices, they are not new, but the different lies in difference lies in their frequency volatility and the intensity mm. so that is what is causing a concern for us and farmers scientists and policymakers have to adapt to this reality so the solution is green revolution 2.0 has to be about the varieties that can withstand the extreme temperatures and rainfall variations while yielding more using less water and nutrients so one answer to this is promoting millets cultivation and this should be accompanied by better crop, crop planning and market intelligence. So farmers, they must know what to plant, how to manage their crop at various stages under different stress scenarios and when to sell their crop. So agriculture for today and tomorrow cannot be the same as it was yesterday. So very beautiful article. So the huge capacity of China's defense and Russia's massive expenditures of the artillery shells and other materials in its war on Ukraine 
have raised concerns in the US and elsewhere that Beijing may provide Moscow with military aid. And along with Taiwan, tensions have been rising with US over China's militarization of the South China Sea, which it claims and recent show over the downing of the Chinese spy balloon. These are some of the concerns between USA and China, and some of them are also related to other countries as well. So Turkey is working to continue the Ukraine's Black, Black Sea grain deal and for export from the ports, Russia blocked. So Turkish Foreign Minister has said in Sunday that Ankara, that is capital of Turkey, is working hard to extend a UN-banked initiative that has enabled Ukraine to export the grain from the ports blocked uh, which is blocked by Russia following its invasion. So the Black Sea Grain Initiative brokered by the United Nations in Turkey last July allowed the grains to be exported from three Ukrainian ports and the agreement was extended in November. So Russia has signaled that it is unhappy with the aspects of the deal and we are working hard for the smooth implementation and further extension of the Black Sea Grain deal. However, obviously then it will be for the cause of concern if the trade is not going to happen so rohingya camp in flames rohingya refugees they try to salvage their belongings after a major fire at balukhali camp in the cox bazaar district in bangladesh which was caught in fire thousands were rendered homeless as far as spread through the time settlements agriculture and employment so today we talked about green revolution 2.0 today we talked about how can farmers income can be doubled apart from that here we are talking about agriculture and employment so the farm sector produces less output but it adds more value that is why it is able to support 45% of the country's employed labor force right now. But it is necessary for India to have fewer people in agriculture. So this has been always the thing that we always talk about when we are talking about agriculture and e-development. So when we compare agriculture versus the manufacturing sector and we have a look at it, so here we are analyzing the percentage share of the workforce that is employed in agriculture and manufacturing and what has been the trend over a period of time between 1993 till 2022. So when we have a look at the green color, we are seeing that the height is declining and post 2011-12, we can say almost it has been at the same level, but it has declined marginally. So we can say that the percentage share of the workforce in agriculture has been steadily declining. And earlier in 1993, it was at 64.6%. Now it is at 45.5 percentage. So although people are working out, people are moving out of the agricultural sector, now we need to look at that whether they are moving towards the services or the manufacturing sector is the next important thing. And having a look at the blue color, so the share is, it was like at 10.4% when we're talking about the share of workforce in manufacturing, it was 10.4% and it now stands at 11.6%. So not a major change in the manufacturing. So we can say that it might be possible that maximum of the people, they are still moving towards the services sector. And chart two is showing the value added to the output ratios, value added to output ratios uh, in terms of percentage. So agriculture has a share of 80%, manufacturing has 21.65%, mining is 58%, total it is at 48.32%. And when we have a look at services, so services has been not clubbed, they have been divided in this manner. So you can have a look at all of them. This is basically showing the value that is added to the output uh, ratios. So it is definitely highest in the agricultural sector. 
and two recent sets of data released by the NSSO and the NSO offer insights into the process of the structural transformation in the Indian economy, especially in relation to the agriculture and manufacturing sectors. So economists, they refer to the structural transformation as basically a compositional shift that entails transfer of surplus labor from agriculture to sectors where productivity and average incomes are higher, particularly manufacturing and the modern services that I was just speaking about. And the NSSO's latest annual periodic labor force survey report of 2021-22, it shows that the farm sector share in the country's employed labor force was at 45.5%. That's down that we've already looked at through this figure, but still it is higher than 2018-19 lows of 42.5%. So it dipped to even 42.5% in 2018-19, but again it is increased to now 45.5%. And clearly the effect of the pandemic induced the economic disruptions, which had forced a reverse migration to the farms, haven't fully subsided. So it was majorly because of the COVID-19 that we saw a large amount of reverse migration back to the villages where people, they started, again, depending upon the agricultural sector for their income and livelihood. So the stalled star transformation, we've already understood this thing through this chart one. Also understood the output and the value added ratio. So link with the employment. High value addition is a key reason why agriculture is able to employ so many people. So the sector share in GVO. GVO is the, is the gross value of the output. That is the total value of all the goods and services produced by the country. It was only 11.4% in 2021-22. When measured in terms of the value added or the gross value added though, the share rose to 19%. So it was the other way around for the manufacturing. Its share in the overall gross value of the output was a... Uh, as high as 35% while being just 15.8% relative to the gross value added. So value of the output and value added are two different things. And even taking into account the high value addition, a sector generating 19% of the income according to the primary factors of the production, namely the owners of the land, labor, and the capital cannot support 45% of the country's population. So moreover, the GV and GVO ratio, it is not a measure of productivity. But the agriculturist uh, may be adding more value to every unit of input he consumes than a manufacturer. But the productivity is a function of the output per worker or per unit of land, which is low in agriculture compared to the modern manufacturing and services. So it explains why the average farmer earns less than his urban counterpart. And to earn more, the farmer's productivity has to definitely go up, which means producing more on the same land with fewer hands. And at the end of the day, there is no escaping the fact that India has too many people in agriculture. They need to be enabled to find employment in other sectors, which will in turn raise agriculture's productivity. So this is one of the things that would be helping in increasing agricultural sector's productivity. So we are seeing that RBI's home price index increases across India despite the rate hikes. So they are on a rise when we have a look. So the red one are for the previous year's third quarter and blue one are for the current financial year's third quarter. So we can see the bluer one are more in height in Delhi, it has increased. In Mumbai, it has increased. In Bengaluru, Ahmedabad, in all India level, it is just increased and increased. So little gains when we're talking about that India has leveraged the opportunity of, you know, importing a higher amount of crude oil from Russia. So when we uh, analyze the entire situation, we come to know that India could save only $2 per barrel even after Russia's deep discounts. So the ramp up in purchases of discounted Russian crude oil by India, the aftermath of the war, it is likely to have resulted in savings of around $2.5 billion in the first three quarters of the current fiscal 
as per the analysis of India's trade data for this period. So, however, the savings, while substantial for India, they are far lower than what many had anticipated among the reports of deep discounts being offered by Russia, although oh, it is obviously better than nothing. And as per the analysis, the cheaper Russian oil, they lower the average landed price of the imported crude for India, the world's third largest consumer of the crude oil in the world. And the total value of the India's oil imports for the period under consideration was $126.51 billion. So the analysis suggests that had Indian refiners they paid for the Russian oil, the average price they paid for the crude from the other suppliers, the oil import bill would have been almost $129 billion, around 2% higher only. And the value of the oil imports from Russia for the period was almost $22 billion. And the road sector has the maximum number of delayed projects, so which leads to the problem of cost overrun. So as many as 871 projects are delayed with respect to their original schedules. So other sectors include the railways, the petroleum industry, where we are having this problem of cost overruns. So qualified stock brokers, how are they crucial for the markets? What are like the additional regulatory requirements for them? How are they designated? Why are they important? So SEBI defines the quality stock brokers as those entities who can likely impact the investors and the securities market, as well as the governance and the service standards. So due to their size, trading volumes, and the amount of the clients' funds handled by them, the qualified stock brokers occupy a significant position. So how are they designated? Uh, a stock broker will be designated a qualified stock broker on the basis of four parameters. So they are the number of active clients, the total available assets of the clients, trading volumes, and end of the day margin obligations. So these are the four parameters. And what are the additional regulatory requirements for, the, for them? So the stock broker designated as a qualified stock broker is required to meet the enhanced obligations and discharge responsibilities to ensure the appropriate governance, risk management processes and the scalable infrastructure framework for the robust cybersecurity framework and the investor services. So that's all for today. Thank you so much for joining on Sarkari. And you'll be also getting the PDF link in the description box. Apart from that, do not forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't. And like this video and share it as much as possible. Thank you so much for joining us.